In this uh, session, <coughs> we'll try to focus on the spread risk and the default intensity based model. So the first part of this uh, session will focus more on the spread risk. Now, we know what is a spread, especially from a credit dimension. When I talk about the spread, it is the difference in the yields. Difference in the yield. There are different ways of defining the spread, but the more common or a generic way is nothing but the difference between the yields from, uh, so here I take uh, a security for which I would uh, <coughs> try to uh, look at, uh, the, evaluate the risk, right, which is uh, either a corporate bond or uh, whatever the security which is of my interest and I take the yield of it. There are different ways we talk about their yield. I take the yield of this particular bond and I'll take some reference like a benchmark, benchmark security, I take the yield of that and the difference between the two yields is what we call as the spread and in this process it is in the basis mechanism it is assumed that the maturity of both these instruments whether it is the security of my interest as well as the security with which I am comparing. So both of them should have a same level of maturity. So whatever is the difference, it is a reflection of the additional risk that is uh, present in my security of interest compared to the benchmark. So it's a, it's a straightforward mechanism or indication of the excess risk that is present in the security of interest. So from this dimension, if I start understanding the spread, we talk about various uh, definitions of spread. The more common ones being the yield spread, which is nothing but it is the difference at the YTM layer. Yield to maturity of corporate bond minus the yield to maturity of the reference bond. Whatever generally a treasury bond is what is taken as, as the reference bond here or a benchmark here. The difference at the yield to maturity layer of both these bonds is what is considered as yield spread or sometimes people call this as the nominal spread also. Now, here this kind of a direct subtraction can work whether only if this particular bond which is of my interest and there is an equivalent treasury bond both at the same maturity layer. So, if my corporate bond is a 20 year bond I should see that there is a 20 year bond that is available in the treasury securities. If it is available, the YTM of both of them, all else remaining the same, the difference between their YTMs is what we call as the yield spread. Sometimes we use a word called I spread, which is just a small modification to this nominal spread. For example, I don't have a 20 year bond. But my corporate bond is an 18 year bond. But when I look at uh, the treasury bond, there is no 18 year treasury bond. Probably there is a 20 year treasury bond and there is a 15 year treasury bond. Now, what we will do is, okay, find the yield YTM of this 15 year bond. Find the YTM of this 20 year bond. Using interpolation, Try finding out what is the YTM for this 18 year bond. Using a simple interpolation mechanism, find out what could be the YTM of an 18 year bond. Do the comparison after you, after you do the interpolation of the YTM and arrive at a new YTM in case the maturity 
uh, in case a treasury bond of that exact maturity period is not available. So whatever that YTM that is being computed and subtracted from the corporate bond, that spread is what we call as I spread. So it is also same as a nominal spread or yield spread, but only applicable to those uh, uh, to those uh, securities which uh, for which uh, the benchmark bond is not available for the same time period as the comparing bond. Then we talk about uh, Z spread or sometimes we call it as zero volatility spread which is nothing but here the excess is being used here the instead of directly doing the subtraction here compared to a benchmark bond we add up some basis points at each spot rate instead of uh, doing the differentiation at a YTM level we are trying to find out the difference at the each uh, spot rate level so typically uh, uh, one unique value that is added to all the spot rates and uh, trying to equate the price of the bond to the market uh, so the market price to the present value of the cash flows so basically it's like this okay if these are the cash flows right and if the spot rate let's say here it is uh, 5% here it is 5.5% uh, and here it is uh, 6% like this, if uh, these are my spot rates, 6.2%. Now, what we are saying is, you add a constant factor here for all of them. You add a constant factor here for all of them and find out uh, and equate this value to the price of this corporate bond, to the current market price of this corporate bond. Then try to solve what is this value of x where both left hand side and right hand side are equal. That x will form my zero volatility spread. So it is that excess which can be added to each of those spot rates so that the present value of the future cash flows of my uh, uh, corporate bond would be equivalent to the price of the bond. That kind of a spread is what we call as zero volatility spread. And option adjusted spread. This is a spread wherein which is more and more applicable if there are embedded options on my bond. If my bond is having some embedded options in it, so to adjust for the optionality, we talk about the option adjusted spread. So we, we always uh, talk about option adjusted spread is nothing but the Z spread minus the cost of the option, option price. So this is a kind of a relationship that exists between the option adjusted spread and the zero volatility spread. Considering the cost of the call option, we are talking about an adjustment to the zero volatility spread thus creating an option adjusted spread apart from this there are many other spreads that are very much in use i can talk about the credit default swap spread which is nothing but the premium the premium that is charged on the cds is what we call as the CDS spread. Sometimes we talk about asset swap spread. When we are doing an asset swap, whatever the spread that is on the floating leg, whatever the spread that is coming up on the floating leg, that is what we are calling as asset swap spread. 
So like this, we have so many variants of the spreads that are available. But generally what I see is either the nominal spread, which is the yield spread or an improved version of the nominal spread, which is the I spread and the zero volatility spread. These are the most common forms of spreads that are used. So we need to be quite comfortable with respect to the calculations associated with each of these spreads. Right? Now, the next important aspect that needs to be looked at is we have understanding of a term called spread 01. Earlier we have used this word DV01 which is nothing but the dollar value of a basis point. So what did we say there? If the yield changes, if the yield changes by one basis point, what is the change in the price? What is the dollar change in the price? That is what we are calling as a DV01. The exactly same concept comes with respect to the spread 01, DVCS 01, otherwise it is called as dollar value of credit spread 01, which is nothing but, see, now let's say using a, a, a YTM spread, yield spread or Z spread, I come to know that this is a spread, spread is equal to let's say 2%. Now, what we are saying is, if I have to find out uh, the spread 01, it's like I will increase the spread, increase the spread by 1% or change the spread, I don't say increase, change the spread by 1% or, or probably one basis point, this is not 1%. We are talking about one basis point. Change the spread by one basis point and observe what is the change in the price. So, which means, let's say if the original spread was 2%, probably I may talk about a spread of 2.005%, right? 0.05% uh, is what is uh, one basis point on the higher side. And probably I can talk about 1.995%. So I will see if the spread is 2.005% versus the spread is 1.995%. I will try to find out the price of the bond. And so which means I am giving a shock by 0.5 basis points on the upward direction to the spread and 0.5 basis points in the downward direction to the spread. So, whatever the change in the dollar price per one basis point change in the spread is what we call as the spread 01. And what we generally uh, observe is if the spread is much smaller, if the initial spread is much smaller, now the uh, spread 01 will be much, much higher. For the simple reason, uh, if the spread is much, much uh, smaller, if the original spread itself is much, much smaller, let's say increasing it by 0.5% uh, uh, or decreasing it by 0.5% will have a very big impact. Let's say if the spread is 0.2%. So increasing it by 0.5% means it is becoming 0.205 and decreasing it is becoming 0.195. Now, what we see is, uh, uh, in a relative manner, the impact is much higher here compared to here. Right? 2 becoming 2.005 versus 0.2 becoming 0.205. The impact is much higher here, a change of 0.5 basis points compared to here which means the impact on the price of the bond also will be much higher. That is what is suggesting 
spread is if the spread is very very small we see that the spread 0 1 will be much much higher because the impact the percentage wise change in the spread is much much higher in this case compared to this case so the impact on the price of the bond is going to be much higher which itself is a clear understanding for us that the spread 0 1 is going to exhibit some level of convexity it is having a higher values at the lower spread and it is having lower values at the higher spread so some kind of convexity is going to be established by your spread 0 1 also right so this is uh, the most important uh, thing that we need to uh, understand as a part of the spread race first understand what are the various forms of spreads and how they are computed and uh, one of the various me measures of that uh, spread risk being the spread 0 1 all right now moving on to this uh, default risk <coughs> Right, we will talk about uh, the default risk. Generally, this default risk gets treated as a Bernoulli trial. Especially default risk of a single company gets treated as a Bernoulli trial. Because as per the Bernoulli trial, any process can have only two values, success or failure. So at any point in time, I can talk about a particular uh, firm, either default or non-default. Right? And uh, if I am assuming that it will default with some probability pi, then it will not default with a probability 1 minus pi and uh, during a particular time period t so we can also talk about so based on this we can say that the mean value going with this binomial distribution the mean value of default is pi and uh, the variance of the default is nothing but pi multiplied by 1 minus pi as per the definition of the Bernoulli trial because one of the most important thing for us to consider the default risk as a Bernoulli trial is <clears throat> each trial needs to be conditionally independent. We will talk about this. When we say conditionally independent, it doesn't mean <clears throat> if a particular firm has not defaulted for the last five years. It doesn't mean that it will not default in the 6th year. The chances of default in the 6th year are equally same as the chance of default in the 1st year itself. Now that it has not defaulted for the last 5 years doesn't mean it cannot default in the 6th year. Right? That is a typical memoryless kind of uh, a scenario. So, only when we assume that the default is going with such a kind of uh, mechanism, then only we can treat it as a Bernoulli trial. Here I am talking about only during a particular period. Right? I am talking about during a particular period, its chance of defaulting. See, it's not a cumulative probability of default. Right, probably when I am saying pi is uh, the probability of uh, default and 1 minus pi for non-default. So, if I am talking about uh, the probability of surviving for 2 years, I can take it as 1 minus pi squared. Or the probability of surviving for 5 years, I will take it as 1 minus pi to the power 5. And what I observe is this number will keep uh, coming down and down means the probability of surviving will come down and down as the time period increases because at some point or the other some kind of default is bound to happen. So one way we try to model the default risk is assuming that it follows uh, 
a Bernoulli trial or goes with a binomial distribution kind of an uh, approach. Otherwise, we also try modeling this default risk using a Poisson distribution and exponential distribution, Poisson and exponential distribution kind of mechanisms. Wherein we assume that we, we assume here, uh, uh, especially the exponential distribution whenever I talk about, we assume that uh, this is generally used for modeling the waiting time. Generally, the usage of an exponential distribution is it models the waiting time. So, which means I can use it to model the time to default. I can use it to model the time to default. So the density function for the exponential distribution goes as lambda e power minus lambda x, where lambda is treated as the rate parameter. Now the same rate parameter is also an input as a part of the Poisson distribution. In case of Poisson distribution, we talk about, we try to model the number of defaults within a particular period. Right? So here, just see the relationship. Here, the exponential distribution is helping me to model the time to default for one particular uh, firm. Whereas the Poisson distribution is helping me to model the number of defaults within a particular period. For both of them, they are using this word lambda, which is called as a rate parameter or the hazard rate. So what is this hazard rate talking of? It is the rate at which a particular event is bound to occur. The rate at which the event is occurring. Probably you may say 3 defaults per year. That is how we define the rate. Right? 3 defaults per year. Rate is always with respect to a time. So we will talk about the hazard rate means 3 defaults per year lambda. So when I am trying to model an exponential distribution, I will use this lambda e power minus lambda x. And we know for a Poisson distribution, probability of having, let's say, one default or probably probability of having x number of defaults is lambda per x e power minus lambda divided by x factorial. This is the probability of having uh, x defaults during uh, a particular uh, period. Whereas uh, the lambda is like, uh, it is a hazard rate that will come out as X number of defaults per year. So the inter, inter arrival time will be modeled using the exponential distribution and uh, finding out that the number of uh, defaults during a particular period is modeled using the Poisson distribution. And what we also see is, see in this case, right, whatever, uh, we also see one more uh, relationship, this lambda can also be written as 1 by beta. Generally, in case of exponential distribution, we take this lambda, I mean, we generally uh, write uh, the beta as 1 by beta times e power minus x by beta, where 1 by beta is more similar to that of lambda itself. And uh, we, we also see that for, a, for a, a Poisson distribution, the mean is lambda and the variance is also lambda. Whereas when we are talking about an exponential distribution, we see that the mean will be 1 by lambda, which is beta, and the variance will be 1 by lambda squared, which is nothing but the beta squared. 
so these are some of the so sometimes the default rate can very well be a modeled as a hazard rate and we can use the poisson as well as the exponential distribution or in some cases we can use uh, a Bernoulli trial and model it as a binomial distribution itself. Alright?